Now, wasn't that some good praise and worship? It's been hard for me to keep it together throughout to this, this week. I've had a long week. There's been a lot happening. My wife went off to a woman there out loose, and I stayed home with the kids. There's been games, fall league, football games, cross country meets. It's been a long week, but I'm so excited to spend this time with you. The older I get, <laughs> the more I understand the statement, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I understand the context of that is that they could not go to church. But ain't it something how this pandemic hit and we could not go into a church building? So the older I get, as I said, when I just make it through the week, if I can just get back into the house of the Lord, I know that everything's going to be okay. I know that the things that I'm worried about, I won't have to worry about. I know that the problems that I have, I won't have to worry about those problems in that moment because I've made it to another week. So when I tell you I am glad to be in the house of the Lord, I'm glad. And I'm glad you're here with me. We're going to continue our series on it's giving. Of course, the first week, it was just giving. <laughs> it's giving. It was all about giving. Not financial, but what you give. Almost the energy you, you give. Week two, we went a little deeper. It's giving options. You know what I mean? Options is not always a good thing. But options can sometimes be a distraction. When I spoke to my family after service, after fellowship, we realized that the majority of us deal with distractions. Like we focus too much on the wrong thing and it kept us from doing the right thing. We were distracted. And I know the reason that the distraction came from the enemy is because we have an assignment on our life. So it was important to understand that distractions are real. However, giving, it was given options. Today, our text will come from Psalms 37 verse 25. Yeah, the Psalms 37 verse 25, once I read it, I'll give you the title of uh, my message for the day. But I'm going to put that on the screen here. Of course, I'm going to read it from a couple of different translations. First, the King James Version says, I have been old, I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. The NIV reads, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. How about the ERV? One of my favorite, of course. I was young and now I am old, but I have never seen good people left with no one to help them. I have never seen their children begging for food. And the last that I'll read is the Message Bible. It goes from 25 to 26. You know, the message probably usually connects verses that uh, have something to do with each other. I was once young. Now I am a gray beard. I got a little gray here. Not once have I seen an abandoned believer or his kids out roaming the street. Every day he's out giving and lending his children or making him proud. That is the word of the day. And that is God's word. If God's people are there, I want you to say amen. All of God's people. If you're just in your home, say amen. If you're watching, if you're on your phone, amen, amen, amen. You can even type it. Be interactive. Don't be such a passive congregation. Let me know that you're there. So what is this text given to you? About your seed not begging for bread and you being here and being there. What is it giving? Oh, last week it was giving options, but what is it giving this week? When you think about it, and you think about David reading, you know, he, he, the psalm, he, what is he really saying here? Why would he have to tell someone that he's never seen the righteous forsaken, and he's never seen their kids out hungry? Why would you tell someone that? because they're worried. We all deal with worry in different ways. And if they're worried, you have to change their thought process. This text today 
It's giving hope. It's giving hope. You're sitting with somebody, tell them to tie it up today. It's giving hope. What is hope? It's amazing when you look at the definition of hope. It says to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true. Verse number two, I mean, definition number two, to desire with expectation of attainment or fulfillment. That's the one I like best, to, des to, to desire. When you have hope, you desire something. But you desire it with the expectation of obtainment or fulfillment. The last one is to expect with confidence. I expect this, and I am confident that it's going to happen. This text is giving me hope, and I hope it's giving you hope as well. Let us pray. God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for being in the removal business. God, I ask that you remove distractions, remove issues, remove tumors, remove depression, remove anything that may hinder your word from going forth. God, I ask that you would have me decrease and you increase in me so that your people can hear what you want them to hear. Not what I, not what my flesh wants to give, but what you would like to transfer through this screen. God, we ask that you would make the environment conducive to preaching and teaching. God, we love you. We love your word. And we love the way you're going to shower it on us right now. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this text. Thank you for giving me what I needed in the moment, in the time that I needed to give it. And I thank you for everybody under the sound of my voice that's going to be blessed by this word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. It's giving hope. How does it give hope? How does this text give us the anticipation that something is going to happen? How does it... <laughs> make us feel like what we're going through won't be to the death of us. I understand that I'm not the only one, or I may be the only one that's going through right now. I, I may be the only one dealing with something in my family. I may be the only one dealing with something in my body. But if I'm not, if I'm not the only one that's having to, you know, see my way through stuff, then you need a little bit of hope just like me. Hope that something's going to happen. I'm going to give you four points and they will be aligned to the original giving. But first, giving is perceptual. That means it's based off how we see things, right? So the point number one I have is hope comes from your ETA. Hope comes from your ETA. Verse 25 says, I've been young and now I'm old. I've been young and now I'm old. Hope comes from your estimated time of arrival. See, when I estimated that I would be a certain place by a certain age, I lose hope. See, I thought if I had done more, that I would have been further. I shouldn't be struggling with this addiction. I shouldn't be dealing with this weight issue. I shouldn't be having to, you know, explain certain things to my children because I expected it to be better by now. I expected the relationship to work. I'm supposed to be married. I'm supposed to be debt free. I'm supposed to be a millionaire because I did what I was told that would lead me to success. But the issue is that hope comes from your ETA. And when you put your ETA on God's time and not your own, you can then have hope. 
it goes in reverse when you think you have the power to control time. And we don't. Your estimated time of arrival will really mess you up. It's almost like when I know I have to be in a certain place at a certain time, I say, well, it only take me 10 minutes. But I don't take in consideration that there may be an accident on the way. I may have to stop for gas. I may have <laughs> to use the restroom. The text says that I was young, but now I am old. And I think it's important that when, there, when this scripture, when this person is talking to the person in need of inspiration, they say, I've been where you are. And when I was where you were, I expected to be a certain place. But now that I'm older, I can look back and say, my timeline was all jacked up. My expectation was off. And when you change your expected time of arrival to put TBD, to be determined, I'll get there when I get there. I'll get there when God says, it's my time. And then you can enjoy the journey. You can enjoy where you are. Hope comes from your ETA because giving is perception. Point number two, hope comes from your experiences because giving is personal. Hope comes from your experiences. What you went through will help develop what you hope for. The scripture says, yet I have not seen. Now this is an experience. I have not seen. I'm now older. I've not seen the righteous forsaken. I have never seen good people left with no one to help you. When I was young, I thought a certain way. I thought that if I make this mistake, my career will be over. If I send this text, the relationship will end. If I just don't watch this, the addiction will be over. If I don't go there, I don't have to worry about danger and violence. But now that I'm older, I can look back and say, I saw some good people do some bad things, but yet their seed was never hungry. Yet they were never left with no one to help them. If you're that person, and you're thinking that you're by yourself, this scripture gives you hope. Your experiences will give you hope. What you've been through in life will give you hope. It will say that, hey, I done watched a whole lot of people go through a whole lot of things, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Never. I've never seen them with no one to help them. Never. And God's not going to break a room just to get back at me. I, I strongly doubt you'll be the first person that he forsakes. You'll be the first person that he does not help. You'll be the first person that he leaves alone. You're not that important, I'm sorry to tell you. You're not. Hope comes from your ETA. Hope comes from your experiences. Point number three, hope comes from your expectations because giving is predicated on the giver. What do you really expect? If you're having issues with hope, think about it. What are you expecting anyway? Did you expect to fail? Did you expect for your kid to get in trouble? Did you expect that when you went and talked to the counselor that they were going to say bad things about you? The ERV says, I have never seen their children begging for food. The Message Bible says, or his kids roaming the streets. That one really, that one got me there. What expectation have you set 
for your life? What expectation have you set for your kids? And when I talk about your kids, let me make it a little bit more personal for you. What expectation have you set for what you have birthed? For what you have offered the world? I birthed comedy, but do you expect it to succeed? I birthed athleticism. I birthed, you know, joy. I birthed construction. I birthed, you know, order. When I go into a building, when I go into a situation, this is what I bring to the table. And when I bring this, I expect this. Sometimes you don't have the hope you need because your expectations are so bad. You don't even expect to be successful. You don't even expect to be loved. You don't even expect that relationship to work. You knew it was going to fail before you even got into it. You have to change your expectations. Remember, giving is predicated on the giver. So when you expect greatness out your kids, when you expect greatness out your job, when you expect greatness out your church, out yourself, you can have hope that this is not where your story ends. Let's go back to the top. Hope comes from your ETA. Hope comes from your experiences. Hope comes from your expectations. And last but not least, hope comes from your endurance. How well are you able to endure what you're going through? I got this from going on to verse 26. It says that they are always generous and lend freely their children will be a blessing. If you are that parent, and this was out, this is especially for the parents, and you're worried because your kids just ain't lining up with the things that you put in place, understand that you are the righteous and they will never beg for bread, they will never go hungry, and they will be a blessing to other people. That scripture brought me hope. That no matter what I'm going through, no matter what my situation may be, giving was predestined by God. My hope was predestined by God. As long as I can endure the place that I'm in now, if I can just get through this, I will be okay. If I can just get past this, I will be okay. It's all about endurance. And God puts us in these situations so that he can see what he can do with us, what he can do for us, and what he can do through us. Because he knows that if my child, if my saint, if my pastor, if my uh, bishop, if my teacher, if my apostle, if my lay member can endure this, then I can put them in this situation and use them for that. It's all about endurance. It's about endurance. So I just want to give you a little bit of hope that you will make it out of this situation. This is not how your story ends. This is not the end of your chapter. This ain't it. It will get better. Change your ETA. People, when you're thinking, oh, I should have been, stop all of that. Enjoy the journey that God has you on. The ups, the downs, the cricket bosses, the happy places, the pay raises, the furloughs. Enjoy it all. Evaluate your experiences. Now that you're getting older, look back and say, well, God did it then. He did it in 98. He did it in 05. I made it through the recession. I made it through the, you know, the housing market issues. I made it through the pandemic. I made it through the social injustice. So I know I can make it through this. He ain't bring me all the way here to leave me. And then you need to evaluate your expectations. What are you expecting from your situation? What are you expecting from your spouse? What are you expecting from your day? Did you wake up and say, oh, it's going to be a bad day? 
Urges you wake up and say, this is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. What are you expecting? And how long can you endure? What other option do you have? Quit, roll over and die? Guess what? You don't even have the authority to die. You don't even have the authority because it ain't your life. You don't got the authority to do that. I've heard stories of people pull a gun to their head and pull the trigger and they were still alive because God didn't sign off on that action. When it's not your time, it's not your time. You just need to endure. You will make it. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this word. If it didn't speak to anybody, it spoke to me. God, I have hope. I have hope that the promises that you gave me, they'll come to pass. God, we love you. We honor you. We praise your name. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the way that you treat us. We thank you for covering us. We thank you for the hedge of protection. I personally thank you for protecting my son this week. Thank you, God. I don't know what I would have done if I lost him. I just thank you. I thank you for protecting my spouse as she drove to work every week, every day, in traffic, tired, exhausted. You kept her alive. God, I thank you for covering me. I thank you for accepting me just how I am, flaws and all. And God, right now, we lift up the individuals that don't know you. And we ask that they will believe in the salvation. They will believe that the gospel is true, that you came from heaven and earth. You died on the cross. You were put in a borrowed tomb. But in three days, you rose again. And then, and only then, when they believe, they're saved. That's all it is. It's, it's not about repeating some fancy. It's about believing in the resurrection, believing that our sins are covered by your son's blood. I pray that they believe today. And if you just, if this is the first time you believe, I want you to say, I believe and I'm saved. I believe and I'm saved. I believe and I'm saved. God, we thank you. We love you. We ask that you would bless our week that you would give us health, longevity, strength. Keep us up, keep us lifted, God. Thank you. In your mighty name we pray, amen. I thank y'all for being with us this day. I pray that your week will be blessed. I want to say congratulations to Pastor Cheryl Mentor, Apostle Cheryl Mentor. Congratulations. You deserve it. We honor you. Now, this is Pastor Coach McKissick of Be The Ram Global Fellowship. I challenge you to win the 97% and be the ram in someone's life. God loves you and so do all. That's it. That's all. And goodbye. I'm out. <laughs>